thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, this is my latest work that's just about to appear in the inaugural issue of a new journal called Sound Studies Review. Let me begin by playing where this started for me as a teenager, uh, haunting the stacks of the Long Beach Public Library and looking at scores of modern music. And I found these pieces by Arnold Schoenberg. And let me just pay you, play you a passage, which is going to end with what I'm going to really talk about. And it's those last sounds that I want to direct your attention to. And they're called harmonics or piano harmonics. And what happens is that the keys are pressed down silently. And something's happening in the resonance that happens above it. And that's, it caught my attention as a kid. And I wondered at the kind of mystery of having notes that weren't played but still sounded. So it was somehow playing music that, that didn't exist. Or, so for 60 years, I've been trying to find out something more about it. And this lecture is about it, about the phenomenon of harmonics in general, and about how they're related to a kind of larger project I have, which is trying to explore uh, the relationship between music and science, which goes back, as um, most of us know, to the Greeks and to Pythagoras in particular. Here are images of the experiments of Pythagoras on strings and pipes, um, in which somehow whole numbers govern the consonant sounds that he heard. And this became a kind of crucial uh, influence on uh, Plato and on all of thought since then, trying to pick up on Pythagoras' ideas uh, uh, Plato reformed education so that it would no longer be just memorizing Homer and learning to do a few simple sums, but studying the seven liberal arts, which is what we're all here to do, and in particular their higher division, which is these four sisters, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, who together were the constituted the gateway to philosophy and to education properly understood. And as I've tried to argue on other occasions, these sisters are the mothers of what we call the sciences now, especially the interaction of music with the more mathematical arts. But as I was thinking about it, in this story, music was the elder, and the modern sciences that we know were the children. But it, I started wondering what ways there might be, these being all immortal beings, both the music, astronomy, uh, arithmetic, and geometry, these are immortal beings, and so are their children. What might the interactions of the, ch of the, of the parents and the children be that would go back and forth between them? So not merely that the parents formed the children, but that the children talked back a great deal to their parents. And so this is a story about the influence going the other way between science as it gradually developed and music. And it concerns what are called harmonics. And let me just, just to illustrate them to you, basically, if you take a string instrument and touch it, for instance, in the middle, you hear a kind of strange flute-like sound, which sounds the octave. And you could play it with a... You could play it with a stop figure, or you could just touch it. And when you touch it, you get that strange flute light song. And that's not the only one. 
There are lots of them. And they're at the places that were located by Pythagoras at the ratio of two to one. Um, okay, th these are all whole number ratios, three to two. And you can hear it has a different quality of sound uh, than the Pythagorean, than the Pythagorean, um, than a regularly stopped sound. And they must have been played, it's hard to know what place they had in the performance of, of musicians. But what, we're, what I'm concerned about, it was trying to find out when did these harmonics become known to people and how did that, how did that happen? And in this story, these are sometimes also called overtones because they represent the different, the different vibrations of a string. And Marin Marcin first described these, which he called petits sons, little sounds, in 1636. He and Descartes were describing them in letters back and forth um, about in the same time. Up until that time, as late as the time of Johannes Kepler, so his book on music, and, and astronomy, 1619, he thought, and everybody else had thought since the Greeks, that the way that numbers operated on the physical world was through a kind of divine archetype. That is, that the numbers appeared in astronomy and in music because somehow they were a part of a divine order in which there were, those ratios were out there somewhere beyond the world in a, what Plato called the beyond heavenly place. Um, and those, somehow or other, those mysteriously, those intervals imprinted themselves on physical physical world and even on the human soul. So that when we play an octave, somehow the soul is, is imprinted enough with that ratio of some kind of two to one, as, as in the string length of the violin, that it will respond. But Barsen realized something that changed music and science uh, decisively, which was that, in fact, there were a, a single sound, a single string is actually sounding many notes at the same time. And his experiment, which you can find described in the handout in which we used to read in sophomore music, you may want to read for yourself, uh, Marcin explains how you, what you have to do is you have to get in a very quiet place, ideally late at night, uh, which shows you that even in the 17th century it was loud during the day. But anyway, late at night you sit at home and you pluck a string and if you listen very carefully you can hear not just the string sound, but the octave above that, the fifth, those five overtones, as many people call them now, which he called the petit son. And he also was able to identify them in the sounds of bells, actually are clearer and easier to hear in, in sometimes in bells. So this was a crucial discovery because all of a sudden what had been immaterial platonic forms in the beyond heavenly place were actually things having to do with the, with the ratios of the physical vibrations of strings. And there was also something very mysterious going on that a single string was capable of vibrating in at least five ways at once. You could actually, as the sound decays, you can hear a little bit more of that sound. So you could hear it even though it's not nighttime. <laughs> so th this discovery was perplexing and is, was a really important moment because people realized that there was a kind of physical basis for what was going on in the, in the, in the mathematics of sound and in the way th th that it worked. And it, about 1700, a man named Joseph Sauveur, who uh, located this and related it to the harmonics, to the sounds I played for you on the violin. He even gave those sounds a name. So is a very interesting guy. He, he was considered by his, his contemporaries to be deaf, although he was probably more nearly, uh, had a speech, some kind of speech difficulty so that he couldn't speak, he could barely speak. But he became, curiously enough, or maybe appropriately enough, the founder of acoustics, a science that he actually named and wrote the first book about it in 1701. He called it Principles of Acoustics and of Music or a General System and Intervals of Sounds and their application to all systems and all the instruments of music. 
This word acoustics was the study of sound in general, which he considered what he called, quote, a science superior to music, which confined itself to sound insofar as it is agreeable to hearing. So in that sense, Sauver, maybe because of whatever kind of hearing difficulties actually had, he was interested in turning the study of sound into a science that was like optics and had a lot of resemblance to it. And he tried, and he gave a diagram trying to explain how and he how these sounds would result. And he actually named them sons harmoniques. So that's where the name comes in French. And he talks about stopping something a fifth of the way down the string, touching a string at the middle, at the point C, and then basically because of the light touch. You're removing all of the vibrations of the string except the one that has this particular wavelength. So it was a kind of subtraction of all the many sounds that Mersenne heard inside a single sound, which is you know, which which is somehow responsible for the peculiar sound of a violin as opposed to a piano. And he was able to locate it now and to subtract out all the sounds except one. And this is very, very similar to what Newton had done with color. Newton was able to take a prism that would break up white light into all the spectrum and then could block all the colors except, let's say, green. So in that sense, this was a kind of very, very similar to optics. It was a kind of subtractive account of what was going on. He also, Sauver also was able to show that he, he, he pointed out that this, these were not conceptual, that actually if you put a little piece of paper at those points, C's, that he called nodes, uh, that point, those are the still points, because that's the curious thing. The harmonic is produced where the, where the, where the, the string is not vibrating, so that if you want to hear that particular interval, you touch it at the point C, and then, um, Th that that nodal point stops all the other vibrations. The others he calls the bulges. It's interesting too that even though Sauver was deaf, he pointed out that if you tried, if you if you sort of go up and down the string, he called it a chirping, a gazouillement of the different overtones. A kind of very curious effect where you're just sort of lightly touching all the harmonics, which then later composers like Stravinsky used as a kind of an evocative, as an evocative effect. The curious thing also is that these harmonics are always in perfect Pythagorean tuning because they correspond to the ancient Pythagorean intervals. That's despite the fact that already by 1700, already for several hundred years, people had messed with the Pythagorean tuning and we were, they were already playing it. Something that approached was not the same thing as the equal temperament of the piano. So there's a way in which the harmonics preserve a kind of fossil of the most ancient and the purest kind of intonation, even in the middle of a kind of tuning system in which every note in the piano deviates from, the, from that kind of Pythagorean in order to make it possible to play in all, all of the 12 keys, uh, major keys at once. So uh, in trying to popularize Sauver's ideas, uh, Fontenelle, who was a very important kind of popularizer at the time, he's just trying to describe to a, a broader audience what, what Sauver is doing. And Fontenelle says, the science that concerns the sense of hearing is perhaps no less developed than that which has vision as its object, but until now it has been less thoroughly investigated. The need that philosophers have had for telescopes and for microscopes have obliged them to study with extreme diligence the different qualities and varieties of light. But as they have not had the same need to know precisely all that pertains to sound, since they have most often treated music as a matter of taste, the meaning of which one does not seek, to deep, seek deeply into philosophy, they have not turned their speculations in that direction. But these experiments essentially gave people a microscope in which they could actually see the vibrations. And Fontenelle pointed out that you, if you actually used an ordinary microscope, you could actually see and measure the actual physical vibrations of the string. So that from an immaterial object, these became 
material and vibrating bodies. Now, it probably is true, I imagine actually, that Sauveur didn't discover the harmonics, what he called the harmonics, from nothing. He probably heard someone, some violinist or guitarist, pluck a string and hear that kind of funny sound. But no one had ever written it down. There was no notation or any name for it. The first piece, the first set of pieces that actually had notation for this were written in 1738 by Joseph Mondonville. And they would put a little kind of open, open sign above it. And not long afterwards, another composer um, named uh, L'Abbé Le Fils, 1761, this is already pretty late, wrote a minuet entirely in harmonics. And you see the little O's indicate, uh, they indicate the production of a harmonic. And it's curious because the further, harmonics are sort of like up, up, usually in musical notation, the higher the note is on the scale, the higher it actually sounds. It's the reverse for harmonics because you're stopping them down. So if you listen to the beginning of this piece, So it's interesting that he decided he was going to make a whole piece out of them. And the French, it's kind of interesting that, of course, Sauveur is French, and he was writing for the Académie de uh, Royale in Paris. Um, the French embraced harmonics. The, the rest of the world, not so much. Leopold Mozart, writing just before this in 1506, this is uh, Wolfgang's father, he was very critical of this. Obviously, this was a kind of popular technique. He says, he criticized the perpetual intermingling of the so-called flagellates, flagellate, he says it in German. Uh, and he says, he, see, he disliked it because it produced a really laughable kind of music, I'm quoting, owing to the dissimilarity of tone, one which fights against nature itself, and which becomes at times so faint that one must prick up one's ears to hear it, but at others one must stop one's ears against the abrupt and unpleasant clatter. With such performances, those who associate with carnival merrymakers would distinguish themselves excellently. So he's very sarcastic about it. He really, really dislikes it. And he sarcastically invites anybody who really likes these to write his own concerto or solo and not to mix them with the natural violin tone. So it's interesting that, it, it, you know, already Mozart's father is really, really dead set against it while the French were already mad for it. The turning point in this development is owed to this man, Niccolo Paganini, who used harmonics all over the place and, you know, in the early years of the 19th century had an immense influence on people. And he was very, one of his famous tour de force was playing not just a harmonic as a single sound, but he was able to play two harmonics at once. And he kept it secret and wouldn't notate it in his scores because he didn't want people to steal it. And he left a manuscript called the Segreto di Niccolo Paganini to one of his friends, who was a violinist, so that the secret wouldn't die with him. And here's, here's an example of how he used it in one of the violin concertos. you can get a sense of how overwhelming this was to people that a human being could do this and produce sounds of a kind of unearthly sort. And so it was Paganini who really put harmonics on the map so that someone like Hector Berlioz, who was a friend of his and wrote a viola concerto from, he used, he wrote a famous treatise on orchestration in which he 
describe how to use them and used in instant Paganini as his as his example. And in his description, Berlioz noted that harmon harmonics are purer and thinner the higher up you go. This characteristic, as well as their crystalline timbre, makes them suitable for what I call fairy chords. These are chordal effects that draw the listener into ecstatic dreams and carry the mind away to the imaginary delights of a poetic make-believe world. And when he used them very famously in the Queen Mab scherzo, so part of his Romeo Juliet um, uh, music, in which he uses harmonics to create the, the world of uh, Mercutio's queen. So after this, I mean, so, so Vera gave the, the harmonics a name and a kind of scientific respectability, but, but it was Paganini that really brought them forward. And then they became a kind of staple of, of 19th century uh, and 20th century music. They're used really all the time. Let me take an example that's particularly important for Schoenberg, which is the beginning of Gustav Mahler's first symphony, written in 1889. And Mahler was, in fact, a great kind of patron and, and, and friend of helper of Schoenberg. But here you hear, this is a description of the awakening of spring. It's a good thing to listen to today, in which um, the spring is evoked by a very, very low A, which is played by the basses, and then in harmonics, the other instruments above, the other string instruments sound this kind of fantastic kind of very, very quiet chord, and gradually the world comes into being. You hear it, fragments of sound, hunting calls, as if you were hearing sounds of the hunt filtering through the forest. This is the beginning of the first symphony. Oops. So it's a magical effect. It's a really a tremendous effect. And this is, one could give any number of examples. Um, uh, Smetna, who went deaf in his quartet on his life, begins with the quartet with this. That sound, which is the sound of the tinnitus that announced his deafness. And that sound kind of recurs through the quartet on my life as a kind of a, both the kind of the enunciation of his eventual fate and then the actual manifestation of it. So, but the, the thing which was interesting, so this was used in uh, string instruments, wind, wind instruments also are capable of producing harmonics by overblowing. Uh, by overblowing the sound, and so there are parallel sounds, but the way they can be used on string instruments is extraordinary. One would think that the piano, you can't really do it because there's not, you don't have access to the strings. And so um, the idea of having a piano harmonic was not even present at this time, or just, or it w w was just coming into view, and it's coming into view largely as the result of the work of this man, Herm uh, Hermann von Helmholtz, the famous acoustician, natural philosopher, probably the most famous scientist in Germany or in the world in the latter part of the 19th century, I guess with Alexander von Humboldt. And there you see him seated by instruments. He, was the, he started out as an army surgeon. He invented the ophthalmoscope, which is the device that everybody is to use if, when the doctor looks at the back of your eye. He's holding a prototype of that and wrote the great treatise on optics, which explored every physiological and um, psychological aspect of vision. And then right next to it, you see and wrote a famous book on the sensations of tone in 1863. In that, if you look at the detail of next to his uh, 
ophthalmoscope, you see this round thing, which is a resonator, which he used to catch the resonances of sound. And see, he, so he was trying to locate, he was trying to take the sounds that together make a pitch and to see if he could put, not only subtract them out, but to add them back up. So he undertook a whole series of experiments in which he tried to synthesize sounds from tuning forks so that he could gradually get the sounds of vowels or try to imitate the timbre of a violin or of a flute. And among these experiments, he started doing experiments with pianos. About in 1857, when he started to do these experiments to see if you could make an instrument produce a vowel. By the way, uh, Paganini, one of his famous tour de force was that he made his violin say buona sera, understandably. So he's like the violin would speak so that he had somehow solved the vowel problem. So while he was studying this, he described a home experiment in which he and his wife, Olga, took turns singing vowel sounds into a piano whose dampers had been raised by the sustaining pedal. He noticed that the piano would resound not only the pitch, but the vowel itself even more for trained sim singers. And he says, with my wife better than myself. So if we take... Ah... Uh, that's the experiment. And he suddenly realized that the piano could be used as a kind of an experimental instrument. And so it, it, he would start, what he started to do was very similar to Sever's ideas. He realized that what, what he could do is put little pieces of paper on the strings and measure the places where the strings stopped moving and that way figure out which overtone he was dealing with. So, so he was, his conclusion was, he says, a pianoforte is also capable of analyzing the wave confusion of the air into its elementary constituents. Now he does the following experiment of, with, with a piano. He says, I guess, let me move this one over here. Maybe this will work. I'm quoting from his sensations of song. Press down the key of a, a key of a string, let's say the C, which you wish to put into sympathetic vibration, but so slowly that the hammer does not strike and place a little chip of wood across this string. You will find the chip put in motion or even thrown off when certain other str strings are struck. The motions of the chip is greatest when one of the undertones of C is struck. <laughs> And this experiment is now, it's, it's pretty often used in music classes that you will take a sound like a, a major chord and go like this, this is a C to and just hold it down and hold, strike a low C. And you hear the chord, which has not been played, but only excited by the sympathetic vibrations from that low C. That's, I think, goes back directly to to Helmholtz's demonstration. When he, was try when he was trying to explain this, he pointed out that the process which actually goes on in our ear is probably very like the vibrations of a piano. Each stiff hair inside the cochlea is tuned to a certain tone like the strings of a piano. So in fact, we have, according to Helmholtz's realization, was that actually we have a piano in here. It's a sympathetic piano. It's a piano that's resounding to the sounds rather than producing them. It was only much later that people realized that actually the hairs inside your ears can produce sounds, not just, not just receive them. So Helmholtz realized that, that any instrument, says, he says, any stringed instrument, as the piano, monochord, or violin, can produce a harmonic, which he called a flageolet tone, a flute tone. And he used the same, the same, the same way of talking about it, and he, he was able to describe them, um, to describe these experiments, and to make them explicit. And he also made, he made a specific connection between how Newton broke up the spectrum and the spectral analysis of sound. Because the important thing for, for, for Helmholtz was that this proved that each of those overtones had a real and objective reality. We, and he compared it to 
the, the, the Newtonian color spectrum, it disproved those who thought, quote, it to be an illusion of the ear or to be mere imagination when in the musical tone of a single note emanating from a musical instrument, we distinguish many partial tones. If we admitted this, we should also have to look upon the colors of the spectrum, which are separated from white light as a mere illusion of the eye. So this was a very, very interesting moment in which he realized that the analogy between sound and light was complete. And he worked both ways, subtracting, subtracting away overtones or adding them together to try to generate artificially the sound of a human voice. Now, these experiments were picked up. Uh, the example I gave you is one that like, happens almost in every music class in the world, but already in 18... So, 1863 is when Helmholtz first um, he published his book. In 1866, Ernst Mach, the famous physicist who was deeply interested in music, published a kind of version of Helmholtz for musicians, which he took a lot, a lot of the technicality out and tried to explain it. And he had experiments that were very similar. What you do is you hold down the note that's like in the whole, it looks like a whole note, like that first one here is a, an F, and then you strike the C, it looks like a quarter note. And you hear this sound and you hear a whole spectrum of harmonics. And so in, by this way, this became a really popular way of demonstrating what was going on. It became so popular that in the London papers, there were, dis there were descriptions of this. Um, for example, um, they, they would re refer to this as being so well known that even when Helmholtz's name was not mentioned, it seemed as if everybody already knew about it. Um, th it was at this point and that, that, the, that they were first used in a piano composition that you're going to hear now by a man who signed himself Jules Bourgmine, but whose actual name was Giulio Ricordi. And he's the grandson of the famous founder of the house of the music publishers, Bourgmine, the most famous publishers to this day in Italy. Um, he was a very interesting person himself. He was the, Buc the mentor of the young Puccini. And it was also Giulio Ricordi who persuaded Verdi, who had then had gone into seven-year retirement, to come back and write Otello and Falstaff. So he had a, played a very, very important role in musical life. But he was also a composer. And he wrote a series of, of, of serenades called Le Livre de Serenade in 1883, dedicated to Franz Liszt, published in a sumptuous edition. You could, this only gives you a rough idea of what this, what this book lo looked like. In, in this, for the first time, Ricordi used piano harmonics. Um, he doesn't attribute them to Helmholtz, but he is such an educated person. He was also the editor of the uh, um, Gazzetta della Musica, you know, a, a big, you know, one of the standard publications. It's hard to imagine him not knowing about Helmholtz if by the 1870s everybody, even in the London papers, knew about this. So I'm really grateful to David Forrest, my friend and colleague, and he and I are going to play for you this kind of rarely heard piece. This, I'm not sure whether it's, it's premiere. I imagine in Franz Liszt's, um, in Franz Liszt's uh, studio, maybe they played it, but um, we're going to play it for you now. And you'll hear the harmonics at the beginning and the end of this Chinese, quote unquote, serenade. Um, Besides the kind of chinoiserie illustration, there's also a pseudo-Chinese poem that's in here. So it's somehow part of the fascination that Europeans had with, with things um, Oriental, and especially Chinese. So this is a kind of a, a, an instance of something that was widely was, was going on throughout Europe. Just put this down here.
when the first time it really appeared though in a piece that that had a kind of wide distribution this being a very hard is going to be in the work of Schoenberg but I wanted just to pause to 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 talk a little bit more about the the piano experiments that sort of continues because this became a whole theme that the piano which was like in everybody's living room became a kind of not just a musical instrument but a kind of scientific instrument at the same time uh, the the famous music theorist Hugo Riemann was trying to explain why minor why minor chords and minor keys had a kind of stability that was comparable to the to the major chords seemed to be okay because of the overtone series but what about the minor ones so f famously Hugo Riemann again late at night all this stuff happened somehow late at night he sat at his piano trying to hear undertones instead of overtones he thought well maybe it worked backwards although you'll if you read the Mersenne handout, you'll say Mersenne says, no, it it's just goes upwards. The overtones are shortenings of the string, not lengthenings. But Riemann, for a while, convinced himself that he had actually heard undertones, and strangely enough, undertones that were minor chords. And there was a huge controversy about this. And a guy named Georg Capellan said, that's not so. All we have to do is hold down these two notes at the bottom um, and then make a minor chord. <laughs> And you can hear that the, there is a kind of resonance in the piano of the minor chord. And then Riemann got, got really mad because he thought, well, you could do that for almost any kind of chord. And he said, let's take a really, really kind of dissonant, crazy old chord, this one here, and then hold it down. Let's see how I've got this right. No, this one. And you can hear a resonance. And it, whereas he says, that's that chord is distant. That can't make any sense. So there was a tremendous amount of controversy over, over this. And Schoenberg was aware of it. He refers to Capella, and he also makes disparaging remarks about Hugo Riemann. He said, "Who's old? He, he, he doubts anything that his old hat doesn't fit. So it was clear that Schoenberg, who was then a kind of young composer, just doing his earliest works, was must have been aware of this controversy. And it was also very interested in harmonics. So here is a passage at the end, and it's also to give you a sense of where Schoenberg was in 1899. This is the end of his composition, Transfigured Night, Verklärte Nacht, which is based on a poem by Richard Demo, which describes a kind of scene in which a man and a woman are walking out at night. It's kind of an anguished conversation because they're engaged to be married, but suddenly uh, they, uh, the, the woman informs the man that she's pregnant by somebody else. And he, in the course of the poem, comes to a realization that he's going to accept the child as his own. And there's a kind of, the, the, the night is transfigured at the end. And the way that transfiguration is affected is through harmonics. So you will hear this, this last couple of minutes of the piece. And there is a moment where the harmonics are used in a way that's very similar to, to Wagner, uh, to, the, to the Mahler example, to give you a sense of, of transfiguration. These are students at the New England Conservatory. at the same note as a regular pitch.
wonderful example of how the harmonics represent some kind of transfiguration, the opening into another and better world, and also shows you how, what a romantic Schoenberg was and how he was able to write in that late romantic vein, which will serve us in good stead in a few moments because he's going to make a turn in a very different direction. The, the crux of the, this is that he began to use piano harmonics as part in the midst of a marital crisis of his own that followed this poem, a crisis that surrounded this man, Richard Gerstel, who was a painter, a young painter at that time. Here you see him in 1900. He's 18 years old, a student at the Academy of Fine Arts. Um, he is a neighbor of Schoenberg, who is then married to Matilda, who is the sister of his teacher, former teacher and mentor, Alexander von Zemlinsky. They have two small children. They are very, very interested in painting. And so Gerstel starts giving them painting lessons and also paints them. This is his famous portrait of Arnold Schoenberg showing you his, his skill. He was a kind of a rebel against the dominant Viennese style of the time. And here is Gerstel's portrait of Matilda Schoenberg. And to show it, uh, Schoenberg himself, it was a ta very talented painter. This is his self-portrait in the year 1908 in Chinese ink. Okay. And here's Schoenberg's portrait of Matilda. Okay, so he's very, very, he's strikingly talented. But in the midst, in the midst of these art lessons, then in the year 19, in the summer of 1908, the friendship took a different turn, and Matilda ran off, left the Schoenberg and the children to go off with with Gerstel, and he uh, Schoenberg was completely overwhelmed. He wrote. There's a very interesting document called in German the Testaments Entwurf, a kind of draft of a last will, which has a significance which is like the Beethoven's Heiligenstadt Testament, which he wrote when he realized he was going deaf and he decided he had to write his will, maybe almost as a suicide note. So this, in this very kind of, um, uh, uh, this, this document is filled with contradictions. It alternates between cold denials. She lied. I believe her. She did not lie to me. I deny facts, all of them without exception, and agonized avowals, quote, I have cried, have behaved like someone in despair, have made decisions, then rejected them, have had thoughts of suicide and almost carried them out, have plunged from one madness to another. In a word, I am totally broken. In the midst of his struggle to understand his wife, Schoenberg uses the piano experiments as something that's going to guide him. In, his, in a kind of very agitated paragraph, he grappled with whether or not, or in what sense, his wife may have lied to him and what he should make of that. So this is Schoenberg speaking. Now, it can't be denied that subjectively she consciously lied, for she presented to me the opposite of what she believed to be the truth. It is possibly that sub she subjectively lied, but I don't actually know anything about it. I must have slept through, or, through it or forgotten it. Perhaps I didn't notice it at all. If I sing a pure note A into my piano, then all the strings that contain A also ring. But if I sing a wrong note, higher or lower, the reverberation is much weaker. Obviously, only some distant overtones resonate. Musically wrong, useless. But I believe that the well-tempered piano really doesn't know anything about them. It can forget them. They don't penetrate into its musical harmonic nature. So it means it's a very extraordinary thing that someone who's undergoing, I mean, a kind of total breakdown is thinking about piano experiments at the same time. And also it goes back to his first wife, you know, this Olga who had, who had died and with whom they had, he started the piano experiments. So this is, so, I mean, it's, then it's trying to, uh, it's very hard to understand then what, what to make of this. Now, after the, the, the affair took a further turn, at the behest of uh, Arnold, uh, of uh, Don Weber and other of Schoenberg's students who saw that, that, he, that their teacher was like completely disintegrating, she came back to him and the children in, at the end of some, uh, summer 1908. But, but on November 4th of that year, Gustel hanged himself after trying to destroy all of his artwork and personal papers. And among the few things that remained is this 
this late self-portrait in the nude from that same year. But he, you know, there are only a very few of his canvases have 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 remained afterwards. And in this, I just 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 to show you something of Schoenberg's work, Jones Schoenberg's own painting in the year 1910, this self-portrait, and then this portrait from the back, a very unusual kind of thing and very difficult thing to do to draw oneself, uh, draw oneself from the back. So this, this upheaval had tremendous effects on him. Um, during, this, during this time, his style took a complete turn away from the kind of tonal romanticism that we heard to a much more advanced and difficult kind of, uh, kind of music. Let me play you one example which is from his second string quartet, which is written during this year. It's a quartet which is very unusual in that the last two movements of it um, have a soprano as well as the string quartet, and they set palms, and this one by Stefan Georg. Um, and you can hear in the music of this, and again, hum harmonics have a big place in this, you will hear this... The, the, the sound of this new sonic world that he had entered into, I think, uh, quite clearly as a result of the kind of personal crisis. This is the, the beginning of the, this mo movement before the soprano comes in. gateway to another world, but it's a different world, and it's a kind of modern world in which suddenly the kind of super romanticism has kind of broken through into this other world. When the soprano enters, the poem that she sings begins, Ich fühle Luft von anderen Planeten, I feel the air of another planet. And this musical journey in, and personal journey into a kind of outer space. So these, they're, 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 there's the kind of romantic feeling, but then there's this kind of constant fragmentation, and the expression, the expression becomes even, even greater. But it's also then interesting that, that, that in the midst of this, Schoenberg decided not only to write, uh, use these harmonics as he had in the, the Transfigured Night or here to sort of signal kind of the most crucial kinds of points of transition. He also decided to use them in a song that I'm very grateful to Consuelo Sanudo, who's a distinguished alumna of the college, um, the wonderful singer who's going to do with me, a song that was unpublished in Schoenberg's lifetime called Amshanda. 
And you'll hear it, this is the first time that he used the, these kind of piano harmonics in a song. And Consuelo is going to, going, to, um, going to read it to us. You see there the, tra the, the German and the transla uh, translation of it. And she'll read this to you. And you can hear, yeah. Oh, yes. Vorüber die Flut, noch brausdes Fell, Windwasser, und oben Stern am Stern. Wer sah es wohl, o oh selig Land, wie dich die Welle überwand? Noch brausdes Fell, der Nachtwind bringt Erinnerung. Und eine Welle verlief in Sand. The flood is past. Far away it still roars. Wild water. And above it, stars upon stars. Who could imagine, O oh blessed land, that a wave would overtake you? Far away it still roars. The night wind brings memory, and the wave sank in sand. And he, he interprets it to Rilke, but one can't find this in Rilke's works. <laughs> so either Schoenberg wrote a poem in Rilke's style, or I don't know what. <laughs> The scene somehow is, is especially stark and appropriate. Two people on the beach, 
the uh, distant flood that overwhelms them. There's a sense of a kind of isolation and alienation that is very, uh, very, very striking. And in the midst of this, let me play again for you the, just because I didn't do such a good job before. So that the distant roaring becomes this kind of spectral, this spectral sound that, that becomes, that goes very, very far away. So in the years after this crisis, after the death of Gerstel, in the aftermath of this, um, Schoenberg went on to write a famous book called Harmonie Lea, which is usually translated as the theory of harmony. He was trying to summarize his um, teachings, that what he had worked on with his students. Um, one of the things that he illustrates in that book, it, it uses as an example, is exactly the same piano experiment that we were we, that, that we talked about earlier. So that somehow these piano experiments continue to revolve in um, Schoenberg's mind, and he also tried to um, connect them to science in a very particular way. He, he starts out by saying, it's our duty to reflect over and over again on the mysterious origins of the powers of art, beginning by regarding nothing as given but the phenomena. These we may more rightly regard as eternal than the laws we believe we have found. Since we do definitely know the phenomena, we may be more justified in giving the name science to our knowledge of the phenomena rather than to those conjectures that are intended to explain them. Yet these conjectures too have their justification as experiments, as results of efforts to think as mental gymnastics, perhaps sometimes as preliminary steps to truth. And throughout he's using the word Wissenschaft and Wissen as the German word for science and knowledge as a way of trying to struggle with what what exactly, how we describe what we know, what kind of knowledge there is in music. Elsewhere, Schoenberg argued that, quote, the true art of composition, like true science, will always remain a secret science, Geheimswissenschaft. And he goes on to say, only a moron would believe that Einstein's theories are looking for a way to reconcile themselves with everyday obtuseness. So Schoenberg identified real, true science as secret, by which he meant hidden or counterintuitive, like Einstein's discoveries, explain, expressing what creative ge genius grasps in contrast to the rule-mongering of those who are only critics. They don't understand what he thinks of as the secret science of composition and music. And here's Schoenberg speaking. Uh, while science, by which he means here the routine procedures that stand apart from secret science, has to demonstrate its problems perfectly and completely without any omission and from every point of view, has therefore to proceed systematically, logically, and consequently. Art presents only a certain number of interesting cases and strives for perfection in the, by the manner of presentation. Therefore, art is more inclined to choose its cases according to variety rather than according to system by presenting what he calls characteristic facts. If theory presumed to make eternal law, Schoenberg objected that it would then ignore all that was new and exceptional, leading it to reject the innovations of young artists. In that case, and I quote, to hell with all these theories, if they always serve only to block the evolution of art, unquote. So he's emphasized an experiential and experimental approach in which theories are maybe only or most useful when they're mistaken, when they get something wrong, because their wrongness might reveal what is what is really true and what is really alive. So that his approach in this teaching was not so much to codify the practice of the great masters, although he's interested in, in them very much, and he thought of um, he thought of his own work uh, as being somehow, I mean when he was trying to explain his work to somebody, he said, my 
new system of composition has ensured the supremacy of German music for another hundred years. That, that is a quote. So he thought of himself as somehow the heir of Beethoven and of Mahler, and that through these, by carrying their work into this modernistic and through this new system of composition, which was no longer anchored simply to a certain single tonal center, but was free, and was able to adopt itself to new laws. Um, he felt that, he said that his method, this method that he called the method of composition with 12 notes was, quote, not a mere technical device, but advances to the rank and importance of a scientific theory. So he somehow thought of himself as making, somehow advancing the, the, the secret science of music in a way that was very similar to what happened in science. And he reflects further about it in a very interesting way. He makes a kind of analogy with chemical compounds. He says, the chemical compounds have characteristics other than those of the elements from which they're formed down to the atomic weights and valence of their components. This is Schoenberg speaking. He's intrigued by this and goes on to say that, quote, the world of our feelings so completely eludes precisely controlled investigation that it would be folly to place the same confidence in the few conjectures permitted by observation in this sphere that we place in those conjectures that are in other matters are called science. So even a false theory of tones might lead to new observations and experiences. And again, he refers to the history of chemistry. Quote, thus the alchemists, in spite of their rather poor instruments, recognize the possibility of transmuting the elements, whereas the much better equipped chemists of the 19th century considered the elements irreducible and unalterable, an opinion that has since been disproved. So he presents his new kind of artistic discovery as analogous to the discovery of radioactivity and elemental transmutation. That is, the, the seemingly well-formed belief in the 19th century that, un, that chemical elements are unaltered has now, he says, been superseded, quote, not from better observations nor better conclusions, but through an accidental discovery. And here he's referring to Henry Becquerel's observations in 1896 of the darkening of photographic plates, which Marie and Pierre Curie named radioactivity. Schoenberg, about this, Schoenberg noted that, quote, the advance, therefore, did not come as a necessary consequence of anything. It could not have been predicted on the basis of any particular accomplishments. It appeared rather in spite of all efforts, unexpected, undeserved, and perhaps even undesired. One can also read these words as describing his own advances in the secret science of tones, which, as we've seen, he connected to a particularly unexpected and undesired aspect episode in his own in his own life. So, from this, the conclusion that 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 uh, Schoenberg drew was that the more remote, and I'm quoting, the more remote overtones are recorded by the subconscious, and then they ascend into the conscious, they are analyzed, and their relation to the total sound is determined. But this relation is, to repeat, as follows. The more immediate overtones contribute more, the more remote, the ones further away from the sounding pitch, contribute less. Hence, the distinction between them is a matter of degree, not of kind. Um, this is very similar to what Helmholtz had concluded. Helmholtz had said, quote, from the most perfect consonants to the most decided dissonance, there is a continuous series of degrees of combinations of sound which continually increase in roughness so that there cannot be any sharp line drawn between consonants and dissonance, and the distinction would seem to be merely arbitrary. And Schoenberg's phrases are so close that it almost sounds as if... Um, as if he were quoting or paraphrasing Helmholtz. So Schoenberg then used, used the examples of his piano experiments to ground his own statement that, quote, the radioactive transmutive power of the full overtone series, the expressions consonance and dissonance, which signify an antithesis, are false. Instead, being no more opposites than two and 10 are opposites. So the dissonances, 
the dissonances that he embraced in, in this new style were more remote consonances. They were the more unfamiliar consonances. They were, in the language of his, of his draft will slash suicide note, these were the sounds that seemed at first to have make no musical sense. The experiences that he had with his wife that he could not understand, that could not he could not square with everything that he knew about them, but that he recognized that they had a kind of reality and force that he had to bow to. So in this way, Schoenberg's piano experiments formed an important link between his invention of piano harmonics and his later quest to emancipate dissonance. That's his phrase, that dissonance should be emancipated, as if it were a woman who was suddenly free to follow her desires, or a composer that was free to use dissonances that were, had not been allowed. The common thread is experiment with pianos, no, no, less, no less than with marriage. As Schoenberg continued to use piano harmonics, he also alerted many other composers to its, um, to its, to their force. He, he. Uh, allied himself with the modernist science of his time with Einstein and radioactivity. Like Einstein, remembering a childhood encounter with a compass, he too felt that, quote, this is Einstein speaking, something deeply hidden had to be behind things, unquote. Whether that was the invisible force that moved the needle or the secret science of the remote consonances previously dismissed as dissonance. Schoenberg may have taken the idea of piano Helmholtz ideas harmonics from Helmholtz, but in the process of making them his own, he recognized a deeper insight. Both music and science looked beyond convention and appearance to seek deeply hidden truths that would reveal unknown realities. The eerie sound of piano harmonics was the music of these new spheres. Thank you. Mm -hmm.